I think the disparities I've seen the most of have been providers who either get overly focused on the fact someone is LGBTQ or they ignore it. Um, and often finding that middle ground of realizing it's a part of who someone is, but not all of them is important. Um, and then it's the same disparities you see in any underserved population. Um, underinsured, uninsured, higher rates of smoking, um, higher rates of um, being displaced from housing, um, all, uh, I mean, mental health issues, not internally, but as a result of societal pressure. Um, and so it's basically, I, when I used to do uh, LGBT 101 talks where I was working, um, which I'm glad I will never have to do again, working in a place that's specifically focused here, is was talking to my coworkers about how usually when you have LGBTQ health disparities on a slide, you could substitute almost any group that has been pushed to the margins and they'll have exactly the same sorts of issues going on with just minor variations. Like it's all the same symphony, it's just different instruments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with that. I would say that in the trans community specifically, a majority of states in the United States do not have employment protections, do not have housing protections, do not have uh, you know public accommodation protections, do not have protections for adequate health insurance, right, um, and do not have non discrimination protections in healthcare settings, right. So I'll give one example. Say you are a trans woman going in for your first appointment for primary care and you also want hormones and they look at you and they, they discriminate against you or unintentionally discriminate against you. Maybe you perceive discrimination, right? And you say, I'm not going back there again. Well, you also don't have access to your hormones, right? And so you're trying to say, say you're a binary trans woman, you're, you're trying to pass in public, right? maybe you have some facial hair right and maybe that then leads to increased discrimination right maybe there's no housing protections right and so now you can't actually get a home or an apartment or some place to stay maybe you try going to uh you know the dmv to get a license changed and you know that that still requires a level of uh, ability to understand and comprehend that information and just time to be able to do that too so there are tons of hoops that are just baked into a system that is inordinately designed by cis, white, straight men that uh, really creates undue burdens on the ability of trans people to exist. And I think that predominantly affects trans people of color and trans immigrants, right? So we are then seeing those rates reflected in social determinants of health, right? Because if you cannot get access to your health care, which is a gateway for many trans people to purely exist, then you see increased discrimination, increased rates of murder, uh, difficulty in uh, being able to navigate systems, access issues, not even being able to get to an appointment, language issues, right? Especially for folks that can't speak the language um, or be able to really interpret and understand information. There's just so many barriers that exist. So I would Agree, I'd say your natural, the, the same social determinants of health that you see in other populations, but then exacerbated for trans populations when your very existence requires for you not to be discriminated against in a healthcare setting or other settings. And I would say also that when, I, when you think about a lot of communities that are on the margins, that you, um, we always hear about using the ER as your safety net. Is what happens when you get really sick. You get really sick. For trans people, the ER is often the least safe place for them, and so they don't even go for that. Um, and we're seeing, as we ramp up here, we're seeing people who have not seen a provider for literally decades. And this isn't that whole thing where like people disappear from medical care during their you know late teens and twenties. Um, this is like 
people who just haven't seen a provider at all and are doing the best they can with like non-medical transitions that put them at even more risk yeah. with who's around them. And it's, it's hard. And I think the other area that we specifically are working on here is the same disparities you see in rural healthcare. Um, so we are rural. Um, and you go, I mean, there's, there's the Walmart near here that has, people say you can smell horse manure from the farms behind it. That's true. Mm -hmm. We're rural. And so you have all those rural healthcare disparities that then are stacked on top of everything, all the other disparities going on. Um, because this comes as a huge surprise, I know, in a lot of like Hollywood films and stuff, but trans people exist everywhere not just in the cities yes and <laughs> what we know is that if you are not counted you will not count right and there is just not a lot of demographic data being collected in rural settings on sexual orientation or gender identity so this really also starts on the advocacy side too and really trying to ensure that comprehensive soji information is being collected across the country and using the same the same forms to be same forms so that we ensure that the data can be systematized.